The story of Harry Potter had gone above and beyond after the fourth film. Along with the world anticipating a fifth, the story itself was no longer the magical and fantastic world it started as. Now there was a war going on, wrapped in the red tape of politics and fear. With Voldemort on the loose, the Wizarding World had been split into Believers and Nine. Those who knew the truth were cast aside and looked upon as enemies. The story had become very much a real world, and Harry was in the middle of the maelstrom. Not only were current events a major plot point in the books, Harry was growing up. Even though he was a wizard, he still had his mind focused on life, school, and more importantly, women. The Order of the Phoenix was probably the most anticipated book to be released because at this point, Harry Potter was a household name. Potter mania was in full force, and the book sales went through the roof. The reaction was astounding as this story became more dark and mature. Harry Potter was growing, and along with the story, so did the films. Dan, Rupert, and Emma were no longer those spunky, adorable kids we were introduced to in the Sorcerer's Stone. Now in the middle of their teen years, not only did their features mature, but their acting matured as well. In this film, the young performed just as well as the veterans on screen, and even more so, they played well off each other. Each cast member had something grand to bring to their character. Whether dramatic or comedic, these kids, now young adults, were given a chance to really flex their acting muscles. Alongside the rest of the cast, as always, there was room for some new faces. Emile de Stunton, James Broadbent, and of course, the well-known Helena Bonham Carter, who brought a deliciously insane Bellatrix Lestrange to life. Probably the most talked about newcomer was Ivana Lynch, who played the role of the loopy yet lovable Luna Lovegood. A character who so many had grown to love was portrayed perfectly by Ivana. Ivana herself was also the very first Harry Potter fan to be chosen for a role in these films. With the Order of the Phoenix heading into pre-production, there was a great sense of confidence in the air. Once again, this film, due to its subject nature, would be given a PG-13 rating, and it was no less than expected. With the fans aware of what they would see in all of its grandeur and complexity, they were ready for their favorite faces, and the new ones, to give them a movie that would take this story to the next level, much like the book had already done. Up until this point, the Harry Potter franchise had gotten up to its fourth director with Mike Newell. Each of the directors had contributed so much to the franchise, but at this point there was going to be a brand new layer that needed to be explored. It wasn't so much story related, but it was more about capturing the essence and believability of human characteristics. Mike Newell had brought a great many layers to the story under his leadership by giving the Goblet of Fire realism and grittiness. Much like Chris Columbus, the Goblet of Fire had tired Newell out, and he had no intentions for returning to direct the next film. Luckily, there was in fact another director waiting in the wings. David Yates had already been brought around the studios to observe the Goblet of Fire in production, and out of all the directors that had come before him, he had the smallest resume. Up until now, Yates had directed a few films made for British television, as well as a full-length feature called The Titchborn Claimant. It was his made-for-TV film, Girl in the Cafe, that made Yates stand out because of his emphasis on character development and human emotion. It was the sense of realism and situation that he put his cast through. It was that that showed that he would be able to bring those major factors out in these characters that we had been seeing on the big screen for almost half a decade. Knowing how the story of Harry Potter was progressing by the time Half-Blood Prince was showing up on bookshelves, it was certain that Yates would in fact be the director of Order of the Phoenix and he would also be the final director for the Harry Potter franchise. Needless to say, he was the chosen one, and he brought a new dimension that was needed for the next three films. At this point, the fans were about to see a whole new side to the world of Harry Potter. Alongside directorial changes to coincide with the evolution of a story like Harry Potter, music is key. John Williams set the foundation, and Patrick Doyle added the flair. But now, with the story where it was heading, it was time to make it flexible. It needed to be boastful in one scene and heartfelt in another. It needed to envelop vigilance and fear and entangle love and lust. 
Nicholas Hooper was asked to take up that task, and once again, paying tribute to Mr. Williams, Hooper gave us something very complex yet beautiful. The use of instruments that had not been given to us in Harry Potter, like the classical Mandarin guitar and ocarina, was given to us in some beautiful pieces along with a few unexpected surprises. Although Hooper's work on each film is completely different, you would never expect that it was the same composer that was chosen for the Half-Blood Prince unless it was a piece of music that was already utilized in Order of the Phoenix. Each score brought scenes of deception and romance to the audience's full force. The emotions that were felt through the cast made a deeper connection with the fans than ever before. Even the light and funny scenes were given their own unique sound, sometimes epic and sometimes silly. Amazingly enough, there was even a member of the orchestra that said that he had cried when playing a certain song in the fifth film's score. When an actual musician can say that about the job to bring life to a scene through his music, that says a lot about the efforts that are being put into bringing feelings like that to light. Up until the fifth film, we saw magical events. Children learning their powers through study in everyday life, and only whispers of Lord Voldemort. Once he showed his face, you could sense that everything was going to change. Order of the Phoenix was that change, and it was major. Harry was suddenly an enemy in the political world of wizards. The Minister of Magic was going to stop at nothing to prevent what he felt were lies escaping to the masses. Harry was put through torture physically and mentally by everything from new professors to the media. Those who he trusted in the most started to fade into the background. At the same time, his friends were trying to help him fight those who were hurting him, and Harry takes up a new task, teaching those who believed in him to be great wizards and witches. If you think that's too much for a 15-year-old, try throwing in girl troubles. What starts with his schoolboy crush and ends with the one crushing on him finally winning, it just adds to the madness. That doesn't even compare what his best friend Ron goes through in these two films. All Harry wants in his life is to be normal and be around those who love him, but obtaining goals like that in the world of Harry Potter is not always so easy. These two films also had another hurdle, and that was the pain of loss. Harry being marked for death was something that the fans had known ever since we first met him. At this point in the story, death is actually happening, and there are moments that truly hit home. Amongst the doom and gloom, back in the real world, all the fans could do is rejoice. With the success of Order of the Phoenix in theaters, Harry Potter was as big as it could possibly get. It was because that very same summer, J.K. Rowling had released the seventh and final Harry Potter novel. Muggles were rejoicing on a global scale. The story was complete, and the fans had spoken. In the midst of the excitement, the Half-Blood Prince was ready to go, but just like in the novels, it seemed that dark times would reach out into our world unexpectedly. In the summer of 2008, the Half-Blood Prince teaser posters were sprouting up, preparing the fans for a November release. But there was a writer strike brewing in the world of film and television. TV shows were being put on hiatus, and films were being pushed back for later release dates. Unfortunately, the wizarding world was affected by this strike, and post-production of the sixth film was put on hold. The strike would come to an end, but fans would have to wait until the summer of 2009 for the opening of The Half-Blood Prince. It would be then when Harry's limits would be stretched, and eventually, his mission in life would become clear. Up until the Half-Blood Prince, Harry had gone through quite an ordeal which ended in losing a dear friend. He now understood that Voldemort was going to stop at nothing to find out how to kill the boy who lived. It was up to Dumbledore to finally reveal Harry's mission to face the Dark Lord. Along with the troubles of school and women, Harry dove deep into Voldemort's past to discover his true secret, but it would be given to him at a price. In order to live, Dumbledore made the ultimate sacrifice giving Harry the escape to carry out his task. With the loss of a mentor and friend, Harry would make a choice that no one would have ever expected, and that was to leave Hogwarts and dedicate his life to stopping the Dark Lord for good. This marked a true landmark in the story because it had gone in a completely different direction, and it was also left on a cliffhanger with a clue to uncover a piece to a puzzle to unlock the Dark Lord's vulnerability. Harry was not willing to sacrifice any more lives at his expense, but what he learned was that his friends were with him until the very end, and now fans would have to wait and see the very end 
of this incredible story. Harry Potter as a film series up until this point was like a fine wine only getting better with age. With each new film, the young actors, with no experience at first, had become some of the most prestigious in young Hollywood. They easily put the kid stuff to bed and showed that they could do angst, romance, and even kick some butt with the big boys. David Yates also gave them a chance to show just how real these characters could be. They laughed, they cried, and they showed just how powerful friendship can be amongst them. These two movies, when put aside their novel counterparts, are very complex, with many side plots. The Order of the Phoenix is in fact the longest of the books in page length, and it ended up being one of the shortest of the films. At this point in time, it was safe to assume that a huge portion of the people who were going to see these films had probably never picked up the books. Keeping a story like Order of the Phoenix and Half-Blood Prince with all of their side plots intact in the movies would have ended up disastrous. The true meat of these two chapters were kept in as a whole, giving the watchers the ability to see and understand the main story that was seen on the pages. There was also, of course, a few side plots thrown in, more so in the Half-Blood Prince, but those scenes, especially the ones that involved teenagers in their love lives, were essential. Half-Blood Prince was also more light-hearted of a film, even getting a PG rating. It was not because the film was less mature, but it was the fact that it was a much-deserved break from two previous darker films. It was also a story that was funnier, and more about being young in a complex world. People were reminded that while these kids are in a world of myth and magic, they still are in fact teenagers with teenage problems. Their goal at this point is to live and have fun. It is plot points such as those that gave these characters such believable qualities and kept you interested throughout the film. Of course, there will always be a bunch of people that will lash out and criticize because something was left out. Yet in these two films, there was something that was never attempted. Ever so slightly, there were small original scenes added to these two films, not to try and make the films the director's own, but to add to the intensity or believability of the film. As always, the goal is to keep your viewer interested and connected with your characters, and only by making these characters even more relatable creates a more positive reaction towards the film. For these two Harry Potter films, it seemed that they had finally figured out how to give the books a safe transition to the movie screen. The story was complete, and at this point, it had been nearly one whole decade since the world first heard the notes of Hedwig's theme in the first teaser trailer. Now it was time to give us something that we had never seen before. The mission of a lifetime for the boy wizard was on hand. With his transition to manhood complete, it was time to give the world of Harry Potter's greatest moment a finale for the ages.